afternoon, everyone, at least if you're in an afternoon time zone. Uh, my name is Greg, and I'm an alcoholic and an addict. And welcome to our first virtual International Conference of Secular AA, ICSA. As you probably know, we would have had our fourth biennial international conference last October in Bethesda, Maryland. Um, but COVID put a stop to that and it has been postponed until next year, October 29th through 31st, uh, 2021. Same hotel, same price, same everything. And we'll start promoting that right after this. Our keynote speaker at that conference and our keynote speaker today is Dr. George Koob of the National Institute of uh, Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. Uh, in 2020, I think we've all learned that there's such a thing as the National Institutes of Health, uh, which is the largest, uh, it's an arm of the United States government. It's the largest uh, biomedical research institution in the world. It's made up of 27 separate institutes and centers. And if you aren't aware that there's one of those institutes uh, headed by Dr. Anthony Fauci today, uh, I don't know where you've been. Uh, but we have another director of another one of those institutes, the equivalent in, in stature of Dr. Anthony Fauci. And uh, I don't mind saying this is a big deal. This is a big deal, and I'm very privileged to introduce Dr. George Koob, who heads the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, which is the largest funder of alcohol uh, research in the world. Uh, Dr. Koob has some slides he'd like to share with us. Um, in October, in person, assuming a vaccine and safe travel, Dr. Koob will be speaking on the challenges and opportunities in the diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of alcohol use disorder. Uh, if you would like to know more about Dr. Koob's uh, biography and background, I invite you to go to the director's page on the NIH.gov um, website. But uh, he's an internationally recognized expert on alcohol and stress and the neurology of alcohol and drug addiction. Uh, if you haven't picked up a program, it's, it's posted, uh, I think, in the chat. But with that, that's enough for me. I'd like to introduce Dr. George Koob, the director of the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. Thank you, Dr. Koob. Thank you, uh, Greg, and it's great to uh, see you all and virtually. <laughs> and so um, it is our 50th anniversary, so I thought I'd take a few uh, parochial moments and tell you a little bit about that on, on, the, uh, on, on the way. One of the things I want to emphasize is, of course, we have uh, a, uh, an opioid uh, crisis, an, or particularly an opioid overdose crisis. But I just want to remind you all, and I probably don't need to, that alcohol can trump uh, opioids uh, in a number of categories, notably that there are 14.5 individuals with an alcohol use disorder. There are 2 million with an opioid use disorder. And I was speaking to a reporter yesterday from the New York Times, and she was astounded to hear that we have, you know, uh, 1,700,000 emergency room visits attributable to alcohol as the primary reason. So, you know, I think, and, and we're right up there with deaths uh, annually, um, either directly or indirectly. And one little factoid that I think, or one big factoid that I think is well worth noting is that half of liver disease in the United States now is caused by alcohol. Um, so what are, where have we been in the last uh, 50 years and what have we, what have we accomplished? And, uh, you know, I think uh, a couple of things on a conceptual framework are that we now consider alcohol use disorder as a spectrum disorder ranging from mild to moderate to severe. We know it's a developmental disorder that varies across the lifespan and by an individual with different vulnerabilities. Um, we know it's a brain disorder that can be studied through a heuristic framework, which I'm showing on this slide. 
and we know it's both preventable and treatable. And then I'll speak to this a little bit later, but recovery from alcohol use disorder is attainable and, and often re includes relapse as part of the process. The conceptual framework I've illustrated here um, basically is an argument that there are different stages. Um, they're color coded with the brain regions that are uh, responsible for those different stages and the functional domains that are disrupted. So in the binge intoxication stage, um, it's incentive salience and pathological habits. And of course the blue there is the basal ganglia uh, where the, these deficits are, are medi mediated. For the negative affect withdrawal stage, you have reward deficits and a stress surfeit and that's the extended amygdala there in red, inside the deep inside the brain. Um, and then, you know, the craving stage or the preoccupation anticipation stage where, stage where we have executive function deficits. And that's mediated by largely cortical and allocortical structures. But you can see you don't have to be a neuroanatomist to see that this is largely cortical in the green. And this has provided us with a, a, a way to really make significant advances in understanding you know, uh, targets for treatment, behavioral treatments and where they work and, and, and when people are, are actually uh, afflicted and, and how severely and, and when they will have recovered, we hope, in the future. So here's some things that we've accomplished in epidemiological research has enabled us to track progress and challenges associated with alcohol misuse in the United States advances in understanding the genetics of alcohol use disorder have implications for prevention and precision medicine. Research has established that the adolescent brain is uniquely vulnerable to the effects of alcohol. Longitudinal studies that assess predictors and consequences of adolescent alcohol consumption continue to inform prevention and treatment strategies. Understanding the role of stress neurobiology and alcohol misuse has implications for risk and recovery from AUD. Um, there's a menu of effective behavioral therapies for treatment of AUD. There are currently three FDA approved effective medications for treatment of AUD. Uh, recognized by researchers in, in the 1970s, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder has been a longstanding research priority for NIAAA with significant advances now in diagnosis and someday we hope in treatment and prevention. And then as Alcohol-associated liver disease contributes to increasing alcohol-related mortality. Treatment remains an unmet clinical need, but something we are researching. Um, you know, alcohol, I'm sorry, I'm just talking about alcoholism. Alcohol and uh, you know, current challenges and priorities include mental health conditions. Alcohol misuse often precedes uh, diagnosis of uh, mental health problems. Um, in, in a help in, in, in an effort to cope with um, you know the uh, the sorry um, with the uh, an effort to cope with some of the stress that uh, exacerbates uh, one and the other. Uh, pain, al acute alcohol at binge levels may reduce pain, but chronic alcohol and withdrawal increase pain sensitivity. Uh, disrupted sleep, uh, persistent sleep problems during abstinence promote relapse and are a major impediment for recovery from alcohol use disorder. And then we have emerging trends in alcohol use in the population, alcohol use among women, gender gaps are narrowing for prevalence, early onset drinking frequency and intensity of drinking, having an alcohol use disorder and many negative consequences of alcohol misuse and increasing alcohol use among senior adults, um, you know, is, is, a, is an issue. This is my generation's cohort and one in 10 uh, individuals in this aged cohort uh, um, are engaging in binge drinking. And, and to focus a little bit on the mental health uh, issue, alcohol misuse correlates with poor mental health. It often precedes diagnoses of mental health conditions. It's commonly used um, in, in an effort to cope with symptoms. In, in the end, it makes the prognoses worse. Similarly, mental health conditions complicate treatment for alcohol use disorder. This uh, caption says, I'm right here in the room and no one even acknowledges me. Um, 
Paul Summergard when he was president of APA and did his, his plenary address. And we were uh, uh, re responsible for the NIH component of the American Psychiatric Association meeting that year. Paul said, if you've never seen uh, alcohol use disorder in your practice, you're delusional. Um, and, you know, one of our biggest goals, and, and this is something we expected you all will be helping us with, is that um, is closing the treatment gap. In the US, fewer than 10% of people with alcohol use disorder receive any form of treatment. Routine healthcare presents a unique opportunity for prevention, early intervention, and treatment of alcohol use disorder. However, many healthcare providers do not perform alcohol screening, are not aware, aware of evidence-based treatments, do not know where to refer patients for treatment. So our goals are to improve physician training in substance use prevention and treatment at all levels and integrate prevention, early intervention and treatment into routine healthcare. One of the things that we're gonna be doing in this regard is developing a clinician's core resource. And when I define clinician here, I'm referring to every, everyone from a pharmacist to a nurse practitioner, to a physician's assistant, to a primary care doctor, to a board certified addiction medicine uh, specialist. And, you know, we um, are nearing the end of our efforts in this, and we'll be getting this out to a focus group soon. But the modules will include everything for, from prevention and primary care, the role of common co-occurring conditions, neuroscience, diagnostic criteria, evidence-based therapies and medications, addressing stigma and interactions with commonly used medications. And then to support research on recovery, um, we, uh, for consistency across recovery research studies, uh, in addition, NIAAA has engaged stakeholders to develop a consensus research, a research, I emphasize that definition of recovery. The proposed definition describes recovery as a process through which an individual pursues both remission from AUD and cessation of heavy drinking. So these are some of the things that we're currently working on. I want to kind of wrap up by telling you about alcohol as a coping response I call this hyperkatifia. I'll tell you about that later, deaths of despair and COVID-19. Um, you, you know, pre-pandemic, alcohol-related deaths doubled from 1999 to 2017. The death, death rates were highest among men and middle-aged and older adults. The death rates increased over time across all age groups, except for 16 to 20 and 75 and older, and the increase in death rate was greater in women than men. Um, these statistics, along with other recent reports that have highlighted changing trends in drinking patterns and increased consequences of alcohol in women and the aging population, as I alluded to earlier. Alcohol plays a prominent role in the deaths of despair, a, a term coined by Angus Deaton and Anne Case to reflect the, the factors that are uh, resulting in increased mortality in the United States. This is all pre-pandemic, I might add. Um, as opposed to other Western countries where there's been a significant and straight line decrease in mortality over the last 20 years. And so what are the three factors that contribute to these deaths of despair? Well, they're in the graph and the, the diagram on the right, but drug overdoses, suicides, and, and liver disease I've already mentioned, and alcohol plays a role in each one of those. Um, and these patterns of increased mortality have been observed across many racial and ethnic groups and age groups now in more recent studies. And I just wanna show you that to, dove, to, to loop back to the mental health part, any mental illness in the past year among adults age 18 or older uh, have been steadily increasing in, in, from 2008 to 2019. And you can see that these, uh, these numbers um, and, and the graph, this comes from uh, SAMHSA, and the difference between um, the, the uh, estimate and the 2019 estimate, um, it, this estimate in 2019 is statistically significant. So there, there is a significant increase in, in any mental illness, and this goes with depression as well. I'm not showing any of those slides, but I just want you to realize that we have multiple things that were going on even pre-pandemic. And then we add in the pandemic, and we have a bi-directional relationship of alcohol use disorder. Um, so isolation and stress associated with the pandemic could lead to increased alcohol misuse. 
Um, physical distancy can lead to social isolation or loss of social support, which can lead to stress or precipitate relapse for those in recovery. Physical distancing also poses challenges for treatment and recovery. Telehealth and virtual meetings can be helpful options for individuals seeking treatment or in recovery from alcohol use disorder. Um, and there are also biological and behavioral issues. Um, the, the biological and behavioral effects of alcohol misuse could also exacerbate the pandemic. Alcohol produces behavioral disinhibition. I'm sure you're all familiar with that and may promote risky behavior and less compliance with guidelines to reduce the spread of the virus. A person, you know, alcohol is the social lubricant of our society, but um, being in an enclosed space, taking off your mask, bellowing in front of the person in front of you, uh, showing disinhibited um, behavior, um, you know, all the things that you're familiar with that, that alcohol does is it, in its, even in, it, in low doses uh, may indeed be helping spread the virus. And then alcohol compromises immune function. I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but um, alcohol is much more represented in acute respiratory distress syndrome pre-pandemic. We know that acute respiratory distress syndrome is a is a significant part of the severe pathology associated with hospitalization with COVID-19. Um, the cytokine surge that you see in COVID-19 is very similar to the cytokine surge you see in ARDS, which is exacerbated by alcohol misuse. So you get the picture. So, you know, the diagram on the right here that I've shown now, in both slides indicates that there are multiple ways through behavior and also direct biological effects that um, misuse of alcohol can exacerbate the pandemic and the pandemic can exacerbate alcohol misuse. And just for a little more concrete data, surveys um, of consumers in the United States and elsewhere suggest that some people are drinking more while others are drinking less. For those that may be consuming more alcohol, limited data suggests that stress, which is one of my favorite topics, is a contributing factor. For instance, alcohol use increased among college students in March, particularly among those reporting higher levels of stress and anxiety. People who said their psychological well-being was impacted negatively over the, by the pandemic also reported more drinking days and more drinks per occasion. An Australian study found that 20% of people reported drinking more during the pandemic and, ha and about half of those endorsed stress, anxiety, boredom, or worry that COVID-19 uh, as reasons for drinking more. Um, such findings are concerning given that drinking to cope places a person on a slippery slope to alcohol use disorder. It's a form of misregulation. If you're drinking alcohol um, to reduce your stress, when the alcohol wears off, your stress is increased even more. And so you get into this vicious cycle of trying to fix the problem with, with the element that's actually causing the problem or making it worse. Um, and then in addition, increases in consumption can increase the risk of injuries at a time when many hospitals are inundated with sick patients. And finally, it's not on this slide, but we know that, uh, that in a few of these studies, women seem to be drinking more than men or increasing the drinking more than men during the pandemic. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to Alcoholics Anonymous and other 12-step programs is I just wanted to show you that I showed this slide at our National Advisory Council meeting uh, a few months ago, uh, a, a systemic review, which is listed below and published in the Cochrane Database Systems Review by Kelly Humphreys and Ferrari, uh, examined outcomes of uh, 10,000 participants from 27 studies. Um, you know, the problem I have is that uh, the uh, Zoom blocks out part of my actual um, text here, so it makes it hard to read. <laughs> Um, and I never figured out, all right, uh, studies that compared peer-led Alcoholics Anonymous uh, or professionally delivered 12-step programs with other behavioral interventions such as motivational enhancement therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy, 12-step um, facilitation treatment variants or no treatment. So in other words, it was a comparison of, of standard behavioral treatments, but also with a variety of different 12-step facilitations across a variety of measures, AA performed at least as well as other behavioral treatments for a AUD, and AA was more effective in increasing abstinence, which should be no surprise to you all, and I've circled that in red there. Um, these results suggest that AA and 12-step facilitation can offer a low-cost, effective treatment option for maintaining abstinence among those with alcohol use disorder, and I would 
submit that I think I'm preaching to the choir here, but I just wanted to show you this is actually a very nice scientific review. So to summarize, you know, uh, addiction can be misuse or misregulation as a coping response. And we call this um, negative emotional state that's associated with withdrawal from alcohol. It's, it, you know, hyperkatifia. And, and you'll say, well, what, what on earth is that? Well, it's a word I made up. And it's supposed to be analogous to hyperalgesia. So what is hyperalgesia? Well, hyperalgesia is well known to be increased pain when a pain relief medication wears off. And it's now been well documented with opiates and alcohol, I might add, because alcohol relieves pain too, unfortunately, at very high doses. Um, so, so I wanted a word to describe hypersensitive negative emotional state. So I invented hyperkatifia, which um, is the katifia is Greek for sadness or dejection or negative emotional state. And um, our argument is that this uh, contributes to the withdrawal negative affect stage um, and, and of course has loading from a number of things that we consider allostatic loads. And so the argument is that on the top there, you see, you know, that, that we, that normal hedonic tone is maintained when you're not overusing a drug or alcohol in particular. And that's a return to homeostasis. But on the other hand, we know that, that there is a shift in that hedonic tone to ever negative state. And it's weighted down by genetics and epigenetics, childhood trauma, psychiatric comorbidity and excessive drinking. And that's the basically where we believe this allostatic load is focusing on the negative affect stage of the addiction cycle. Uh, I wanna end by mentioning that NIAAA is committed to supporting a diverse research community and research on health disparities. Health disparities are highlighted by the COVID-19 pandemic and recent instances of social Injustice with African Americans are a call to action for NIH and the entire scientific community. NIAAA recognizes that diverse research teams broaden the scope of scientific inquiry, bring, bring creative solutions to bear on complex scientific problems, and encourage research relevant to the healthcare needs of underserved populations. To eliminate health disparities and diversify the scientific workforce, NIAAA is committed to significantly increasing diversity and fully embracing inclusion in the scientific workforce, eliminating health disparities and funding among grantees from underrepresented groups, expanding health disparities research, and ensuring that our research and outreach benefits underserved communities. You know, um, I, I wanna mention that, you know, at the end, I mean, I, I sort of made it in the title, Challenges for Alcoholics Anonymous in the Pandemic and Post-Pandemic. And um, rigorous reviews of research on the mechanism of behavior change through which Alcohol Anonymous enhances recovery have found that AA typically confers benefits by mobilizing multiple therapeutic factors simultaneously, mostly through facilitating adaptive changes in social networks of participants, but also by boosting members' recovery coping skills, recovery motivation, abstinence, self-efficacy, and psychological well-being by reducing impulsivity and craving. And this is a quote from John Kelly in 2020. Um, so some of the areas that I think are important for you all are lack of of direct social interaction produces, uh, this produces unique challenges across the board for treatment of those struggling with AUD. Meetings are a cornerstone of AA, of course. Can, can online AA meetings provide the same social support as in-person meetings? How important is the physical and social context? I'm assuming you all are working on that, but we could actually use some research in this domain. Diversity issues are and will remain a challenge in alcohol treatment availability, stigma, research, and public health during the pandemic and post-pandemic. How do online meetings impact diversity? So, um, I, I, you know, I'm going to totally end now by, you know, letting you know we have a lot of publications. We have two really important websites, Rethinking Drinking and the NIAAA Treatment Navigator. I'm happy to explain them in more detail. Um, and you can help us uh, spread the word of our uh, 50th anniversary celebration on social media. Our website has been updated. It's a living document. So if you think, that, if you think there are things missing, you should let us know. And 
I want to um, just thank you all for listening. Um, I guess that's a sort of pun intended. And um, a special thanks to, to Rachel Anderson and Aaron White, who helped me with these slides and some of the conceptual framework. So I'm going to stop there. I'll be happy to answer any questions that anybody might have.